Hey everyone, welcome to Hot Topics Live. Uh, in today's Hot Topics Live training, we're going to be talking all about home bakery um, packaging solutions, like from A to Z. This is a highly requested topic that I have been working on for several weeks now, finding links to all of the best packaging and um, examples of several different types of packaging that you can use. So if you're stuck with packaging, if you're looking for some new ideas and some inspiration, this is the Hot Topics training for you. So without further delay, let's get right into today's Hot Topics Live. My name is Allison and I'm a former home-based baker turned retail bakery shop owner. And it wasn't that long ago when I was running my bakeries that I was finding myself getting overstressed and overworked while trying to work in my business and at the same time work on my business. So I found ways to save time, save money and have more freedom. And I'm here to share those tips with you so that you can grow your side hustle into the baking business of your dreams. Bam, we're so cool. We're so professional now that we are a thousand members strong. <laughs> Did you guys catch that earlier today? I think it might have been yesterday where I shared that we have hit a thousand members in this group. Yay! Yay us! Yay little group of ours that is just growing and growing. It's so awesome to be um, a resource to so many people. And today's topic is all about resources because... Um, like I said in the intro, we're just going to dive into all the different like packaging dilemmas that you guys have. I asked the question earlier in the group, what are some of the most difficult things for you to package in your bakery? And you gave me great ideas. You gave me really good feedback. And so I'm here with some solutions for you today. So let's jump over into the comment section and say hi to some of my favorite people on the internet. Um, Gabriella chimed in first. What's up, girl? <laughs> it's always nice to see you in the Facebook Live. And Trisha's here. You made it. You're always commenting that I missed it again. So yay for you. Um, you guys, when you opt into that StreamYard thing, it lets me say hi to your actual name. And if you can't opt in, that's totally fine too. So I'll just say, hey, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And then a nice congrats from someone for reaching a thousand, a thousand members. Can you believe it? Um, you know, Chef Jason's here with his puns. Let's learn how to wrap that dough. And Casey's here with yay for a thousand. And another viewer from Houston, Texas. You guys are amazing. I um, am so excited to share today's content with you. Somebody says, uh, where's the StreamYard opt-in info? So right at the beginning of the post, if you just scroll up in these comments, you'll see the little intro and it says like Allison Grant is live. And then there's a picture of our Hot Topics Live logo. And then right in that comment, it says um, streamyard.com forward slash Facebook. In fact, I might even be able to wrap it right here in the chat. And um, because it's like a third party app, you have to agree to let them use your name. So right there in the comments, I just dropped it. So um, it's fine if you do, it's fine if you don't. Uh, I just don't want you to think that I'm not saying your name because I don't know why you would think that. But anyway, um, that does that does help. And then somebody said, it's not there for me. That's why you asked. Okay, well, that's okay. You can still interact the same way. The only thing it does is doesn't show your first name unless you allow it to. So your comments get seen at the same time as everyone else's. If you have questions, drop them in the chat. So um, speaking of that, now that we're a thousand members strong, I'm just going to beat that one into the, into the ground today. Um, 
I just wanted to sort of say hello to all of our new members and tell you a little bit about what this live is and when you can find it and what to expect. So Hot Topics Live happens every Monday, 2 p.m. Central Time, right here inside the group. So if you want to watch it, you just log, you just open up your Facebook app and go to this group at 2 p.m. Central. So be sure and do the um, time change math for your time zone. And uh, every week we have a different topic that relates to running your home-based bakery. And it's always a Q&A style format where I'm gonna present a little bit of training and then I'm gonna jump over to the chat and ask you what questions you have about that topic. So it's a great way to kind of get your questions answered too. Um, and these recordings are always saved in the guide section of this group. So if you can't make it at that time zone and you're watching this on replay, you can still comment along as you're watching a pre-recorded video because I'll get a notification that you're asking a question about something. Like I did a training months ago on the uh, pricing I do tons of pricing trainings um, and I did one a couple months ago and a new member was in yesterday watching it and said, you know, I'm a newbie uh, and I can pop in and say, hi, it doesn't matter if you're watching it on replay or you're watching it live. So um, there's Rachel. I see you now. Hey, Rachel, I'm glad you um, opted in because now I know it's you. So um, this is what happens when you do opt in. So it first looks like that Facebook user with no pro profile. And then you opt in and it looks like that. And I'm so glad that you're a part of this group. So welcome and good job getting logged in there on StreamYard. So um, welcome all the new members. You've landed on the best Facebook page for bakers. Allison is amazing. Thank you so much. I'm going to screenshot that one. That's I have a list of like a little folder of all the wonderful things you guys say about this group and about different um, live trainings that I do. And it helps me to find new bakers and invite them into the group when they see how much you guys enjoy being a part of this community. And um, that really means the world to me. Uh, so I won't get too sappy, but you know, some of you have been around since we were a hundred members or even less. I think Rachel, you might have been around when we were like 10 members. So um, this group is growing. I love it because that means there are so many more people who are getting the tips and training and help that they need and connecting with each other so that you get that feeling of community as well. So that's what it's all about. Um, and I hope that's what it's about for you guys too. Just knowing that you can kind of check in every Monday and learn something about your business and go out there and, and apply it. So, um, all right, enough of the sappiness. <laughs> We're talking packaging today. Um, I have been working on this topic for several months now. Um, whenever I'm chatting with you guys and you talk about either a challenge that you have with packaging or a solution that you have with packaging, um, that I've been taking these notes and I'm um, just sort of collecting the different um, categories that seem to trip people up. So um, that's what we're going to do and talk about how you can solve your packaging problems. And as always, I have a full blog post on this topic. And if you don't usually jump over to my blog and read the full blog post, that's okay. Um, because I give it to you here in a free training format. But this week in particular, you should jump over to the blog uh, because it has links for like the specific sizes that I'm talking about. So I'm going to go ahead and drop that link now and I'll do it again later. You might even decide to follow along if you want to open up that screen um, during our training because you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So when we're talking about packaging solutions, um, we're really, I like to kind of break it into a couple of different key areas. Number one, the first thing to remember when we're talking about packaging is that um, customers really want to be able to see the product that's inside. So, you know, when you go into a bakery and you sort of look at the pastry case and you'll say, I'll have one of those and one of those and one of those, You've already seen what they look like. And so the 
person working behind the counter puts them in a box, they wrap it up for you and you go on your way and you're really happy with your purchase because you know what's inside that box. But when you're selling your baked goods um, out of the market in person uh, where your customers are kind of walking by your booth maybe and looking at what you're selling, if they can't see what's inside the packaging, you are not doing yourself any favors with making sales. So my first kind of category of bakery packaging is um, the variety that allows your customers to see what's inside. So I like to focus on if I'm going for a bakery box to make sure it has a window on it. And that's just a clear panel on the top that you can kind of see down into. Um, I like to also um, keep in stock these kind of cellophane and poly bags because they're so universal that you can actually fill them with anything that you want. So um, over on the blog, you'll see different pictures of baked goods in that type of packaging. But that's kind of the first area that I like to focus on is how can you make this packet, this item more visible for your customers? Uh, so then, then the next um, tip or category is um, focusing on the type of packaging that simplifies your life by proofing and baking or mixing and baking uh, in the same container. So what I mean by that are the uh, aluminum disposable containers that come in several different shapes. There's, you know, the mini loaf pan, the cupcake or muffin pans and cake pans where you can put your batter in the pan, bake it, wrap it, sticker it and sell it um, all in one. So you're not then trying to find a packaging size that works well for the thing you just made, because this thing you just made is in it, the packaging that you're going to be selling it in. And so then that presents a kind of unique situation where sometimes you have these items that are like sticky on top, where they have icing or glaze or jam on top. And you have a different scenario where you have these fragile baked goods that need some special packaging. So um, in that situation, uh, what I like for you to do is to either have a dome lid that fix, fits on top of those containers that you baked in, or a new box that has the window like we talked about so that people can see them. So with all of those types of um, tips and categories in mind, I wanted to go from, I've got seven different types of baked goods and some kind of thoughts about them as far as packaging goes. So um, let's jump right into it and look at my top um, seven categories of baked goods and what kind of tips I might share with you about packaging these types of items. And then again, for the actual link here, you want to jump over to the blog post because they're all linked to the very specific sizes that work well for each kind of container. And, you know, let's be honest, I don't know how many times you have ordered packaging, gotten it in and went, oops, I should have measured that because my cookie does not fit in that bag. Um, which can be super um, unfortunate if you didn't allow enough time to check that packaging before like you need to sell it. And that's happened to me. It probably has happened to you. And if it hasn't, and it does, don't worry. Um, but knowing the exact size that you need is actually a really key part of ordering your pack your packaging supplies because they look like the right size online, and then you try to put your item in it and it just doesn't fit. So um, the list that I have linked over on the blog is specifically sized for all the different things that you're going to be packaging in them and it'll save you time. So, all right. So on with my list of um, seven different categories that are tricky and interesting to package. So the first one I want to talk about is cookies. I know that many of you guys are doing cookies, whether you're doing the big jumbo drop cookie that are just like thick and loaded. I know that many of you do those. Um, and then this also would work for the dry hard um, royal icing frosted sugar cookies. So uh, I have a couple of thoughts about that. And one of them is linked in the blog, which is a self-sealing cellophane bag. So it's got a sticky strip on the back. You slide your cookie in, 
you fold it down and your bag is sealed. I love those. They're not that much more costly than the taller cellophane bags where you need to do a twist tie and some kind of bow or something just to make it look nice. The self-sealing bags um, are so convenient. It makes packaging really simple and it looks very professional when they're done. And so I love those for single cookies. Um, and then you, and then you can talk about whether you're um, going to be selling your cookies in bulk. So maybe you're not selling in person. You're not selling at the farmer's market. You're just selling by pre-orders and you sell your cookies with a half dozen minimum. One of the things that's important to think about is how quickly are your customers going to eat those half dozen or dozen cookies? And would it make sense for them to be individually packaged inside of the larger box that you get them in. And in a lot of scenarios, it does make sense. So if I were to look at your menu and say, oh, your chocolate chip cookies look amazing. I'd like six of them, please. Chances are that those won't get eaten in my house for about four or five days. And how is that cookie going to taste five days later if it's just one cookie in a box? So it's a really good idea to think about or offer or ask your customers if they want each of your cookies to be individually wrapped. And again, those self-sealing cellophane bags are great for that. Um, you can also do the heat sealing variety, but that requires the investment of a heat sealer. If you have it, that's great. But if you don't want to go and make that investment, uh, maybe you're just testing this um, menu item and you don't know yet if that's the investment that you want to make, then those self-sealing bag sealing bags are my next choice. And then they go sealed inside of the box. And then your customers, you've extended the shelf life. Your customers can take three or four days to eat them. They can pass them out at work. Um, you know, with COVID, people are extremely aware of um, people, you know, coming into contact with unwrapped food. So individually wrapping inside of a larger box makes sense. And then uh, while we're still on the topic of cookies, we could talk about the eco-friendly approach to cookie packaging, because this is sort of a sub theme that I hear a lot, especially if you're selling at a farmer's market. And that is that people don't want to use an excessive amount of plastic or non-recyclable materials at the farmer's market, or even if it fits in with your brand to have more of a recyclable, eco-friendly approach to packaging. And for that, I highly recommend the waxed paper bags for cookies. Some people call these glassine bags and they're sort of opaque. So it breaks my number one rule of having your products be visible inside the packaging. But the trade-off here is worth it because they're recyclable and they're affordable. So um, these wax paper bags for your cookies are a great way to sell your cookies individually and you know you have to seal it yourself. They're not self-sealing, but they are affordable and they don't show any kind of grease or um, food residue. They are just wax paper bags. Like if you remember old school sandwiches, if you are like a um, 60s or a 70s kid, <laughs> then you might remember getting your sandwich packed in your lunch in those wax paper bags. And that is exactly what I'm recommending for your cookies if you're looking for an eco-friendly approach to packaging. And I know a lot of you have asked about that. So um, so that is um, a couple, those are a couple of um, packaging tips for cookies. All right. Now the next category that a lot of you have asked about are mini loaves and sweetbreads. And um, this can be anything like a mini loaf of bread, a banana bread, a zucchini bread, or um, anything that you are baking in a loaf. And for those, um, I recommend, I'm sorry, I'm sneaking over at the comments. I promise I'm going to get to you because there's a bunch of good ones. But first, I'm going to get through my packaging and then we'll jump over and chat some more. Um, so for those, I highly recommend the aluminum pans that are disposable. So you're going to bake in them, sell in them, and your customers can recycle them. So those are also what I would consider eco-friendly because they are recyclable and they are so easy for you to be able to package your baked goods in. So I've linked um, a one pound, 
loaf pan and you definitely want to check your measurements because there are so many different sizes of loaf pans. So there's a mini one that I linked on the blog. What I do love about those mini ones, by the way, is that if you are a quick bread baker and you have like a zucchini bread and a Dutch apple crunch bread or a pumpkin bread or banana bread, and you run a couple of different flavors at the same time, two of those mini loaves fit perfectly inside a seven by seven window box. So you can take your two loaves, pop them in the box, tie it with some twine, and now you are upselling and you've created sort of a mid-range price item. And you know, if you've been hanging around here for a while, I always recommend having several different price points on your menu, something in the you know five to $8 range, something in the 10 to $15 range, and higher. Um, obviously this applies to more of like the sweets and treats type of baking as opposed to custom cake decorators. You might not have anything in that lower range, but the majority of you do tend to have a lot of different types of items on your menu. Bundling them together into a higher priced item is a great strategy to increase your sales. And I love those little mini loaves together in one box especially if you're mixing and matching two really interesting flavors that you know your customers are having a hard time deciding between, why not buy both? Here in this box, I have two of them and look how cute they look. And you can see a picture of that over in the blog as well. All right, and then rolling right into things that you bake in the pan and serve in the pan, Let's talk about cinnamon rolls. So, so many of you have said that cinnamon rolls are your challenge when it comes to packaging. And I get it because they're sticky. And I uh, mentioned in the beginning that there's that sticky, frosted, icing, jammy kind of product where it has a sticky surface. It makes it really hard to package because you want this thing to look good when your customers are seeing it or, or receiving it and um, things that are stuck to plastic, they just don't look as good. So um, specifically talking about cinnamon rolls, I really love um, selling in the container that they're baked in. So back to the aluminum containers, many of those options have dome lids go with them. You would bake, you would proof and bake in the aluminum pan, you know, cool it and ice it and then pop the dome lid over it. So that's a great solution so that you can just sell it in that entire container and all the gooey cinnamon dripping stuff that people don't want to lose is still there in the pan. Uh, so there are solutions for selling in the half dozen that way. But since we were just speaking about that little mini loaf pan, those are perfect for baking two cinnamon rolls in. So um, if you are a cinnamon roll baker and you generally sell singles or half dozens, consider selling two and baking them together in a mini loaf pan. Again, those also have the dome lid that goes on top of it. Um, I've also linked a box that is perfect for one cinnamon roll. So I've loved seeing how innovative people are getting with their menus. And a lot of bakers are just going very gourmet, very creative on the flavors of their cinnamon rolls. So buying one cinnamon roll totally makes sense if it is a lemon cinnamon roll. And I would love for any cinnamon roll bakers to chime in with some of their fun flavors right now because I've really been interested in watching this trend. Uh, but if you really want to showcase a very high-end cinnamon roll, then putting it in its own box with a window is a great way to sort of increase the perceived value of that item. And so over on the blog, I've link, linked a really cute little four by four by two and a half, I believe it is, um, bakery box with a window on top. And that would hold perfectly, it would hold one cinnamon roll. So um, there is another solution for a cinnamon roll. So you can do ones, you can do twos, you can do half dozens. Um, it really comes down to um, starting with your packaging first and then baking the product that's going to fit in it as opposed to the other way that I see a lot of bakers doing, well, I baked this thing and now I have to figure out how to package it. So I like to flip that. Whenever you're trying a new product, go look at your inventory of packaging, see what you have 
and then figure out a packet a product that will fit in it that way. All right, next category, let's talk about yeasted items, breads, rolls, biscuits type of things. So this is one where a lot of you have asked about how can I keep the crusty um, exterior of my bread and package it without losing all of the beautiful crust that you work so hard to, to get on your bread. So um, I get it because I'm also a bread baker and I also have done the same thing where I've got my, my dome lid in my oven, I'm creating my steam, I've got that beautiful crackle right when it comes out of the oven and then I've got to take it to the farmer's market and it's losing some of that crispness. So uh, I recommend, this is the way I've done it, and we'll see if you like this and it works for you. I recommend this um, bread bag that is a gusseted paper bag, but it has a small window in it. So it's sort of a um, cellophane panel on a paper bread bag. And when I bake my bread that I want to be crusty, I don't close that bag. So um, not everybody can get away with that, but for many of my breads, I bake them in the morning right before going to the market, and I will take a hot loaf and put it in there and leave it wide open. And when the customers buy it, I go ahead and tape it closed. So that's my solution for keeping that crusty exterior on a loaf of bread is not closing the bag until you absolutely have to. So if you think about it, you know, pre-COVID, there are a lot of bakers who are literally just stacking loaves out there, uh, maybe just with a glove and things like that. When you point at it, they put it in the bag for you. And that's a great way to preserve the, the crustiness, but it doesn't work anymore like that because we, for most uh, farmer's market vendors, you really have to be able to put it in its packaging. If you're not a farmer's market venue vendor and you're just selling by pre-orders directly to your customers, then you have a little bit more forgiveness with when you can package your, your bread but know that it doesn't have to be taped closed. Think about, you know, the French style of buying a baguette in that paper sleeve, it's still open and that helps with the crustiness. So a couple other tips for bread bags and things like rolls and biscuits is back to that poly bag that I mentioned earlier. Of course, you can see what's inside, but I love to keep in my inventory just one poly bag that's sort of generic. I can put in a half a dozen rolls. I can put in some hamburger buns. I can put in a half of a, a loaf if I want to split the loaf. And then just a twist tie and snip the top of the bag shorter if I'm not really utilizing like the whole space of the bag. They're super universal. And again, over on the blog, you'll see some pictures of how I use those bags for a lot of different menu items. Okay, next up is another topic that so many of you have chatted about either on this page or in other Facebook groups, and it is cupcakes. Cupcakes can be extremely difficult to package for two reasons. One is they're fragile and pretty, and we want our customers to get them without fingerprints, without bumps and smudges, looking just as beautiful as when you frosted them in your kitchen. The other thing about cupcakes is they're not exactly stable. So they're hard to transport without them bumping into the side of the packaging and getting smudges on the packaging or not getting them the way that you intend them to look. So um, cupcakes are um, a category that I have a bit of experience with. Most of you know that uh, my chain of bakeries was a cupcake store. And so I speak from experience when I say that there are several ways that you can package cupcakes. Many of them work. There's not one right way to package cupcakes. So the first one I wanted to share though, and again, linked on the blog, is um, the trick for packaging cupcakes as an individual single cupcake. Now, of course, you can buy the clamshell, which if you don't know that term clamshell, it's a hinged plastic, plastic container that snaps closed in the front. Sometimes they're, you know, six by six and it's a big square container, fits a lot of stuff in it. I don't recommend that one for cupcakes unless you're putting four inside of there because one cupcake in a uh, clamshell like that is bound to tip over. They do have fitted 
um, clamshells that are designed specifically for a cupcake. It has a little indents in the bottom. So the cupcake sits down at the base. That is a great way to do it. And that's the way that I have packaged single cupcakes. Usually the, do the dome, the top of it is a little bit domed so that it can allow for a taller cupcake or even a cupcake topper and a candle type of situation. So those are also great. But a lot of you have been chatting about the um, inverted plastic cup technique. And so I have linked that one again over on the blog. Um, and that's a really fun one. I like that for a couple of different reasons. This is where you have a 12 ounce cup and a lid like you would get a soda in, right? And then you flip it upside down and then the lid becomes the base. You set your cupcake on the lid and then you pop the, the cup over it as the dome topper. So there's a couple of reasons why I like this approach. Number one, it's much more affordable than the clamshell shaped um, hinged container for your cupcake. Uh, these cups and lids cost about 12 cents each, where the clamshell um, style can cost much more than that, upwards of 50 cents each. Everything that you save on packaging is profit in your pocket, right? You can make more if you keep your packaging costs lower. So um, the solution, trendy solution right now is those cake, the, the cups inverted for cupcake holders, and they work really well. So you can find the link to that, the right size for that over on the blog. Um, but what about if you need to do your cupcakes in bulk for stability? Uh, so what I mean by that is like you have an order for a dozen, two dozen, a hundred cupcakes. How do you get that where you want to go without them falling over? So I love to use uh, half sheet boxes for this. And um, it depends on what type of decorating you're doing on top, how close you can put them together. But the fuller that you fill the box, the less likely they are to tip over. And then also know that it's just not um, an easy way to, you know, you do have to transport a fairly delicate item to your location or your customer does. So another important factor is how you get that box into the car. So you have your cupcakes in a half sheet box. Uh, I like 24 and a half sheet box. Sometimes the base of the cupcakes touch but the frosting doesn't touch. And um, this is something that needs to be flat on the floor of a car. Um, over in the Fully Booked Academy, we talk about our cake care sheet and how you're gonna advise your customer to transport their cake or cupcakes. It is their responsibility to transport it safely, but you can help them by telling them how to do this, where to put it in their car, um, how to keep their air conditioning on and don't run any other errands when you have cupcakes in the car. But um, I do like the half sheet box for moving your cupcakes from place to place. But again, it is not without a good amount of care. You really have to baby those along. And those half sheet boxes that I like are linked over on the blog as well. And so that brings us to the miscellaneous category of cake cups, sticky topped pastries, French macarons, all kinds of like sort of random things like that. And for this, I like to have um, a generic bakery box that is not too tall. Uh, that's perfect for things like pastries and sticky jam topped cookies. So these can hold about three or four danishes. It can hold like a dozen uh, jam filled thumbprint cookies. If you do French macarons and you don't have those clamshell styles for those, this is a great generic box for all of them. So it's a good thing to have in your inventory just for the, those fussy type of pastries. And then in that category, I mentioned cake cups and cake cups are a really good way to use up your cake scraps, use up your frosting scraps, use up a little bit of your fillings and things like that. And that I can multi-purpose with the same cup that I do cupcakes in. So um, it's nice to be able to have more than one item be used by um, your in, with your packaging. And then um, finally, over on the blog, I do talk about all the essentials that I like to have on hand that just make packaging easier. So that would include things like twine, 
raffia ribbon, which is like a nice paper ribbon for wrapping your boxes, um, grease proof food grade wax paper. Sometimes you can get them in fun colors and patterns. And there's a really cool link to that on the blog with like some beautiful pattern paper um, that I love to line my bakery boxes with, as well as all kinds of ways that you can sort of jazz up your, your packaging. And I have to say, I snuck, I snuck a peek over at the comments and Nora says, I remember fighting with cling wrap. Um, those were the days. Yeah, I do not mess around with those little um, saran wrap packages anymore. If you haven't switched over to the industrial size box of plastic wrap, it's a game changer total game changer. You can wrap up things as you're prepping them. Um, if you've ever worked in a big, you know, kitchen, professional kitchen before, that's what you use. And you can, it's better. It sticks better. Everything about it is better. There are many different bakery items that you can actually package just with plastic wrap and put your sticker on the back. Rice Krispie treats work well that way. Brownies work well that way. I could talk for hours about bakery packaging. I think the goal with all of your packaging, of course, is to show it off so that your packaging looks as beautiful or so your packaged product looks as beautiful as it does unpackaged. Um, and you want to be able to transport it well so that um, it gets where it's going, either to where you're selling it or for your customers to get it home. And um, of course, you want to level up the quality of your baked good with better packaging. So the higher quality your packaging, and I don't mean spending more money on it, but the more thoughtful and artistic it looks, the more of a value your product seems to have. And so you have a goal with your packaging. And I hope that today's list gives you a little idea of things that you can do to package your baked goods in a way that's going to enhance their value. All right, you guys are blowing up the chat over here and I can't wait to hear what you have to say. This is a slightly longer live today. So I want to thank you for hanging out until the end uh, because I do have a special announcement and I'll do it right at the end here. But let's check in with what you guys are saying and Rachel, um, yes, you went back and opted in. And I think that's not the one I meant to show. I wanted to show the one where you said about um, our um, wax paper bags. <laughs> wax paper bags are amazing. We were just chatting about those. And your comment said it's very nostalgic. Wax paper bags do bring you back to those sandwiches in your childhood. But they are amazing for um, packaging individual items. And next up, um, Chef Jason says, it was through a Q&A a year ago. Wow, actually a year ago that I stumbled on and became a member of this group and the Fully Booked Bakery Academy. Allison Grant has definitely been an influ influential part of the growth of Sweet Mission. Thank you. And I remember that when you showed up. That was so um, serendipitous. You were looking for help and I was looking to give away a scholarship into that program. So yay for you. Um, there it is. There's the quote I was looking for. Get nostalgic when you use those white wax paper bags. Um, and you know, the sad part is they're so much more expensive now than they used to be. It used to be like an inexpensive solution for moms to make school lunches. And you do have to pay quite a bit more than we used to. But they're still a good deal. Okay. And this Facebook user says a four by four by two and a half holds six macarons placed in mini cupcake liners to keep them all from rolling around. I love that. I actually have a link over on the blog to the four by four by two and a half. And it's also great for one cinnamon roll. Um, but that's so great to know. I might even go and edit the blog post to share that with other people. So thank you so much for letting us know. And um, yes, we were talking about cling wrap. Nora says, I remember fighting with it. And you guys level up and buy that big old box of plastic wrap. You can get it in two different widths you, or more than two. The 12 inch width, I feel like is a waste of time. Go for an 18 inch. It's a big box. You kind of have to find a special place for it in your kitchen, but um, you can cover the width of a sheet pan if you need to. Okay. And this user says, Facebook user says, I use a small white French fry bag and it holds one to two cookies. I call it a walking cookie. I take gallon jars filled with cookies to the farmer's market and the customers love it. 
Oh, that's awesome. So you're packaging it right there in the, at the market, I'm guessing, from the jar into the white bag. And that sounds like a super economical way to package your cookies. I love that because they can see them in the jar and then you pop them over into the walking cookie bag. Amazing. Okay, you guys. So um, I hope that you've kind of gotten inspired. Lots of different ways um, to package your, your cookies and your baked goods. There's not only one way to do it. There's so many different ways. And just kind of start to think outside the box a little bit. And remember that the more you save on packaging, the more profit that ends up in your pocket. So um, I like to recommend that you steer away from those single use type of packages. And what I mean by that is, um, well, I just had a baker ask me for Mother's Day, should I buy these pink gusseted bags that look like purses to put my cookies in? And I thought those might look really cute, but what are you going to do with the rest of them after Mother's Day is over? So I would prefer to see a generic bag but a big, you know, pretty ribbon for Mother's Day or something like that, because then you can continue to use that packaging later. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop that link one more time. This is for the blog post. Everything is linked in there, and there's so much more that we didn't mention here on the live today that you're probably going to enjoy looking at. And then I said I had a special announcement and I want to let you guys know whether you're watching now or you're watching on the replay that the next uh, pricing your home baked goods workshop is coming up on May 31st. That's two weeks from tomorrow, May 31st. Um, these are always hugely popular workshops. I'm going to go over the basics of pricing your baked goods with you and make sure that you understand all the different costs that you need to include so that you recuperate your overhead, your time, um, your packaging, and so many more elements that go into pricing your home baked goods. So um, within the next day or two inside this group, I'll be posting the link to get registered and be sure and grab your seat for that of a limited seating on those workshops and they fill up fast. So if you're still struggling with pricing your home baked goods, watch for that announcement and get registered for that class um, just as soon as you can. So Gabriella says, yay, I can't wait. Um, we got a Ken Kentucky thread going on here. Let's see. Um, love the pricing calculator. Awesome. I'm so glad that you do. Um, Sue, it, Sue Berry said, yes, Sue Berry from Kentucky. And somebody else says, yay, Kentucky proud. I love it. That is so awesome. You guys are amazing. I love seeing you in the live every week. And I look forward to, uh, I look forward to these all week. Um, the pricing, oh, this is awesome. The pricing workshop is amazing. I highly recommend it. That's so great. I'm glad that you found it so helpful. You guys, I'm telling you how to price your baked goods in this workshop. And if you don't know how to do that yet, you definitely want to jump in on one of these because then we can talk profit and then we could talk growth. And there's so much more that comes when your bakery is making a profit. All right, I need to wrap it up because we've gone 48 minutes. And for those of you who are watching on replay, um, you're probably wondering, why are these so long? It's a big topic this week. We had a lot to talk about. Uh, so um, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for showing up in the chat and just making this such a wonderful place to be. Um, I'm thrilled to have every single one of you in this group. And um, here is to continued growth in the group so that this community just gets bigger and better. All right, you guys, thanks so much for joining me. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Bye everyone.